We have several news stories that just happened to share with you today. Three of them are of Elon Musk clarifying incorrect news articles and giving more detail in Tesla's plans. First, the Wall Street Journal just reported that XAI has discussed a deal where it would receive some Tesla revenue in exchange for providing Tesla its technology and resources. Elon quickly responded, saying the article is not accurate and then went into more specifics of the two companies' AI models. Second, Elon confirmed yet again that yes, indeed, Tesla will be opening more superchargers and asked what regions need them the most. Third, the Financial Times reported that Chinese car buyers are now shunning Tesla. Elon responded saying that Tesla's Shanghai factory is running at maximum capacity and we're going to then share with new data that came out just this morning showing Tesla's China sales numbers and guess who's those numbers support. Finally, good news this morning with Panasonic announcing it's now sending samples of 4680 batteries to some automakers. So my favorite uh, guest that we have uh, quite often is Jeff Lutz. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. Yeah, don't tell your other guests, Herbert. <laughs> Uh, you're everybody's my favorite, but you are well respected. I appreciate your comments, especially on these topics that clarifies all these fake and false news articles. Some of it is correct, some of it's wrong. You can uh, help us figure that out. Jeff yeah. is the ex uh, chief supply chain officer for multiple Fortune 100 companies, and he's now running his own consulting firm. So, Jeff, one of the things that uh, I want to start off with is you know, your ability to communicate with some of the highest level executives on X. And this just happened this weekend as well. Um, so obviously, one of the things that happened was Time Magazine, right, came out with their top 100, you know, AI influencers, and Elon Musk was not on it. And so you came and said this, it's either total incompetence or implicit bias to snub Elon from the top 100 in AI. Mark Benioff, who's the owner of Time, he's the co-founder and CEO of Salesforce, said Mark is a smart, fair guy and shouldn't tolerate either because he owns Time magazine. This is the news article that came out, Time magazine, top 100. Elon's not even in here, which is weird. Just completely, something's right, wrong. Mark responded to you. He said every year the list is mostly different. And he's trying to share that, you know, every time they do this list, there was a time that they actually had Elon as the cover. That's his way to defend himself. And then you said, thanks, thanks, Mark. I see lots of deserved repeats with XAI and Tesla bringing up to, which is great <laughs> because there was repeats of other people. Why can't you repeat Elon? With XAI and Tesla bringing up two of the largest AI training superclusters in the world in just the past year, 1.75 million more Teslas with onboard AI perception. Feels odd that Elon would be below 100 others. Grok didn't exist a year ago today. What's really cool is Mark responded to you saying, Jeff, if you want to write for time or publish a letter in this, let me know. That is so cool, yeah. Jeff. What's your thinking about this whole thing? Yeah, and he followed me too. I, it's fine. I mean, he is, a, I, I do, I do believe he's a smart, fair guy. He's a CEO of Salesforce. Yeah. Um, he's he a, he's a good CEO and he, he happens to own Time Magazine. I was just, again, it's, it's a magazine. It's an opinion piece. I, I, I just think it was important to, let it be known that this seems strange. Like this seemed like there was other forces involved that if you were making a list of the top 100 people influencing the course of AI, even if you go back to, you know, the start of open AI, um, if you go back to just a number of things happening and then you just look at what's happened in the last calendar year, if you're an editor and you're doing the research for this article, you're like, okay, what's really, influence and shape the course of AI over the past year, you know, Elon's in the middle of a lot of it. So it just seems strange. That's why I thought I'd let it be known. And there's a way to approach uh, people like this where you can, you know, you can get their attention, but be respectful. Mark, follow, you know, he said he followed me and he asked me to, to write uh, a letter in article. So I am, and, and I'll, I'll probably send it out here shortly. Um, just reflecting on, you know, you know, maybe, a, you know, a different decision, but again, as Elon said, and others said, it, you know, history ultimately, you know, is dictated by results and, and what actually happens, not so much what magazines say. So I just, it, it's, you know, it was, it's, it was a fine thing to just address really quickly, but, you know, we shouldn't just tolerate things like it, just like let it go either. So it just, it's one of those things where you paid a little bit of attention, but then you move on. We're going to talk about things later in this show that really re reinforce like why you should be on this list, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. And thank you for doing that because it's important to, like you said, get create the whole list. Hopefully you are able to be published and 
Let's uh, let's see if he does that. Okay, so the first story here is more about XAI and Tesla, whether or not they made a deal with each other. And here's Wall Street Journal, who wrote this article this weekend, said Musk XAI has discussed deal for share in future Tesla revenue. So um, apparently this is what they're saying, right? That Tesla will, that XAI will receive some of Tesla revenue in exchange for providing Tesla uh, some of their technology um, and, and so forth. So Tesla would license XAI's AI models to help power its full self-driving, share some of that revenue with a startup. That's what they're saying here. Like things like XAI would assist in, in a Siri like voice assistant um, and even helping with the development of full self-driving itself. And then in exchange, XAI would get a, an even revenue split from Tesla's FSC even revenue split. Oh, that's the first time I saw that word. Um, interesting. So let's, uh, uh, let me just kind of jump past the article because a lot of it's just a repeat, but this is what Elon said. Haven't read the article, but the above is not accurate. Tesla has learned a lot from discussions with engineers at XAI that have helped accelerate achieving unsupervised FSD, but there is no need to license anything from XAI. So great clarification. He then goes on, explains the two different models. So the XAI models are gigantic, containing in compressed form most of human knowledge and couldn't possibly run on the Tesla vehicle inference computer, nor would we want them to. The Tesla AI models have incredibly dense, in a good way, intelligence as they compress video of reality into driving commands, but must operate on a 300 watt computer with memory size and bandwidth far lower than, say, an H100 GPU. Tesla's real-world AI also has a vastly larger contact size than an LLM, as the combined video history from all cameras is several gigabytes in size. So he explained the two differences. What do you take out of all this, Jeff? Yeah, this is one of those things where I think we'll look back. First off, I mean, I think Elon explained it. I think we'll look back in a couple of years, and I do think there will be a partnership between XAI and Tesla. If you think of the voice assistant in the vehicle, and if you think of the potential of you're in a vehicle and you you want to say you know something to the vehicle like you know it's cold in here or or also actually excuse me that's the voice assistant what i meant was if there's some interaction between the voice assistant and tesla full self driving in terms of like you know navigate around this construction or do something you know different um you there may be a scenario where the the, the person in the vehicle may want to give some sort of instruction or be asked some sort of question about the route or about, you know, it's driving. So, so I do think that, but, but, but primarily for a voice assistant, which Elon has talked about in the past. Um, so I do think, I, I think it's a correct statement to say that there is nothing today in terms of something that's in the vehicle. And certainly it's not for, um, you know, to assist with the full self-driving models, completely different thing, but more of in the future as the kind of think of the human brain and Optimus or the human, you know, or the kind of the brain inside of a robo taxi that there could, you know, the voice assistant side of it, it could be powered by Grok. Again, most likely, uh, you know, with some sort of remote processing occurring, but we'll see how that system architecture plays out. But yeah, it's factually, I would say it's factually incorrect, you know, today, obviously the article, but in the future, we could be looking back on, on some form of a partnership between, it only makes sense. Okay. In this uh, reply that Elon made, there was a paragraph that some people are jumping on. Okay. So this is the paragraph here. He said, Tesla has learned a lot from discussions with engineers at XAI that have helped accelerate achieving unsupervised FSD. Okay, so some yeah. people ex interpret that to mean to say that they've already achieved unsupervised FSD. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> what do you think, Jeff? Well, I think there's going to be a period of time where these things are discovered, they're, they're testing internally, and it may be months before the public sees it. But I mean, there's one way to read that is that it's past tense, like helped achieve like, as it's done. Um, or helped accelerate um, the achievement of it. So, that, I mean, that looks like it's one of the possible scenarios is that, you know, 
they believe it's done, but it needs some amount of obviously testing internally. You know, that that's one. I mean, the other, the other thing is it's just misinter- It's a misinterpreted yeah. statement. Uh, so obviously that's there's nothing that. released. That's there's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing released that performs like that today. It's just, it was an interesting, it's an interesting way to phrase that statement. Yep. I mean, I, the way I interpret is that have helped. Okay. But past sense accelerate that have helped accelerate, but achieving is like still happening, helped accelerate the achieving, you know, activity. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, just to reconfirm Elon's replies, because uh, Omar said, I question whether XAI needs a revenue split of FSD when other LLMs are available freely or at a low per token cost. I'd like to see the deal done in more favorable terms for Tesla. Elon replied to him saying, how many fake articles have you seen about Tesla at this point? 100, 1,000, maybe several thousand. Wall Street Journal is talking nonsense. So he's confirmed again. So we're talking today about fake articles. Um, another one that happened recently, of course, uh, several months ago when Elon, uh, you know, made the decision to let go quite a number of the department that was in charge of supercharger planning and where to go. Uh, Omar said more investment is needed in superchargers. Elon replied saying we're opening a lot more superchargers. What regions are we missing? So again, another counter to people saying that superchargers are not a top priority anymore. It's not happening anymore. Uh, what's your thoughts about that reply? I, I think Tesla superchargers are going to be front and center as Tesla starts launching Tesla autonomy in pieces. I know we don't agree on this, and that's fine. There could be multiple opinions. That's that's how these things work. That's what that's what makes a market. Everybody sees these things differently. But I I see this future of immense bundling. I think you agree with this too, uh, for consumers and I think for uh a commercial, you know, like a robo taxi business where Tesla can really start leveraging the size of their supercharging network and start filling that up to levels that it hasn't been before, increasing the utilization of it by providing bundled deals. And so one of the scenarios I see, so I know we just, it just, we touched on the word supercharger, but I think as we approach this 1010 event, and again, none of this could happen, but I see at some point as they launch this autonomy network, well, what would be one of, there's Ubers today that are Teslas. And if your Tesla today has full self-driving 12, five, you know, two or, you know, two or three, you could, you know, sit in your Uber, you could drive for it and you could get from point A to point B driving people with it. And that's already working today. I think the difference is, is on a Tesla network, one of the things that they could start leveraging is their supercharger network. And, and so that, you know, so sign up for Tesla autonomy, be a supervised driver and you get free supercharging, for example. I mean, if you talk to any of the Uber drivers, one of the things that they're, I, I, had, I had somebody drive me that just was holding on to their, their older Model X strictly for the free supercharging that came with the vehicle. I mean, it, it's just part of the cost model of delivering, you know, the, these services and the cost per mile. And then you basically have quote unquote free energy to power the vehicle. I think it's one, it's a big thing. So I, I think super superchargers are one of these things where if you think about Tesla and the sum of the parts, you think about its supercharger business, you think of its full self-driving and autonomy business. It's when you start thinking of the sum of the parts conversation and valuation, when these things start going out on their own and then eventually they could become so large that they're worth more than what they're currently valued with inside of the company is when it gets really exciting. So I know supercharging today isn't tr- is a, isn't a tremendous driver yet, um, but I, I think the size of this network, the you know the fact that it's so far and away in terms of uptime availability and just in size, better than the next best solution or the next five solutions. I think this is a tremendous variable and in input for the future of, of robo taxi. I think we'll talk more about it too later today or tomorrow about how the two could work together in terms of uh, other ways to charge the vehicle. So anyway, I think supercharging is a big variable. And I think one of the things Tesla could do is they could leverage it and bundle it commercial and consumer. Good. Yeah. It's more than just it's um, service for cars. There's lots of ways that it can add value to a robo taxi or maybe even a supervised FSD. Okay. So this next story, I'm very excited to get your opinion on. I think it's important. It's interesting. And you 
have some knowledge about how this all works, which is uh, how does um, American companies or Western companies going into China, how are they treated by the government? So another uh, article that's, you know, obviously trying to create some sort of false information out there, Financial Times came out this weekend with Elon Musk's China dream stalls as hybrids rush past Tesla. Consumers shift to plug-in models from local rivals such as BYD. So what they're trying to say here is that Chinese car buyers are shunning Tesla because all these Chinese car manufacturers are flooding the market with a more advanced electric vehicle models. And they point out this particular you know, data point. The company's share of Chinese EV sales, including battery and plug-in hybrids, slipped to 6.5% in the first seven months of the year from almost 9% a year earlier. So they picked that one particular data point from the Shanghai consultancy. And they're, this guy says from the founder of the consultancy saying it's going to be very challenging, about impossible for Tesla to take sales from any competitor without any new products. All right. So, um, so, so we'll, we'll come well, very shortly here. We're going to share with you the actual data of sales that uh, Tesla has in China. And of course, it's, uh, <laughs> it's as high as you can get. So Noah Smith, though, I don't know who he is, but he replied this. He goes, the China cycle has come for Tesla. Okay. And he described this cycle. There's a fairly predictable cycle of how multinational companies work and operate in China. And it goes like this, right? The company puts its factories in China. They're lured by this cheap production, big contracts, this dream of huge market opportunities. The Chinese then appropriates the technology through some combination of joint ventures, acquisitions, reverse engineering, and espionage. The appropriate technology makes its way into the hands of Chinese domestic companies. And then those companies then squeeze the multinational company out of the Chinese market. The Chinese companies go overseas and outcompete the multinational companies in the world markets. This is the strategy that he says, says he calls a China cycle, and he says it's come for Tesla. Elon replied, replied to him saying, believing the news is silly. Our Shanghai factory is running at max capacity. So what do you think about those um, FUD that's being spread there about uh, China and Tesla? A lot of it, um, a lot of the statements are true about uh, Tesla market share you have to be a real kind of mental midget if you think that the the EV market is going to grow and then all of these entrants are going to come in and Tesla is just going to maintain some absorbently high market share as a first entrant. Anybody who properly models the company and is looking ahead does not model super high. If they are modeling super high or, or just basically maintaining market share, then that's honestly an incorrect way to, to model the company. And the, and the other side of it, I think the other side of people betting against Tesla like to promote this is like, look at the market share, look at the market share coming down. That is a natural progression in any new industry. When, when the, the kind of the first, first to market or the first few to market come in, and then, and then all of a sudden it gets flooded, there's a, there's a reduction in market share. It really comes down to, it goes from a market share conversation to a profit share conversation. And the same thing happened with, with Apple and smartphones and so forth. And the conversation really switched to, you know, it, if you really look at it, they're making phones for 42% gross margin, you know, many years, you know, 15, 16 years after the launch of the product. And that and then and then they're getting a lot of their margins based off of their services, their software and services and in, in, in app store. So it's just a fallacy. If you're on the bullish side of this conversation, you should know that Tesla's market share is going to decline over the next several years. Question is, is what is the size of the total EV industry during that time frame? And is it continuing to grow at a rate where the total number of units that Tesla is shipping continues to grow as well? But the other thing that's going to happen to Tesla, same thing that's happened, uh, you know, in the smartphone industry, is the share of where gross margins are going to come from, the the pool of which it will come from, will shift uh, more from a hardware conversation to a software and services conversation. And to you can be very precise in this conversation with Tesla around uh, assisted uh, driving, around full self driving, around a robo taxi network around their premium connectivity, around all these different, their supercharging, their insurance, all these different businesses. 
that Tesla has built up to really reduce the size, sorry, reduce the cost structure of transport and make it more sustainable. So that's the conversation on this. Now, in terms of this gentleman's, you know, five points about what happens when you enter China, that is traditionally true. That's not a, that's not a FUD statement, but the difference with Tesla and where you have to, you can't just look at this and spread every, you know, spread those five points around across every co uh, company. The difference with Tesla is every couple of years, they have these basically two main tracks of the hardware that they build and ship, and then all the software and services that they do. And from a hardware perspective, we still see today in the US, still today, nobody can, you know, the 2020 Model Y, nobody's been able to produce a vehicle of that caliber, of that quality, as an electric vehicle and be profitable. By the way, including in China above $30,000, that vehicle is, forget about above or below 30,000, it's the best selling vehicle, but above $30,000, there isn't, so when this article says like the, the Chinese have come and it's, you know, Tesla's day is over, that article was written in concurrent, in the same month that Tesla is the number one selling vehicle. Okay, and it's not just one vehicle. It's you know, if you look at the three and Y and above thirty thousand dollars, they they dominate in EVs. They do very well. What's happening in China though is most of the sales are well below thirty thousand dollars, and Tesla does not have an entrant in that tier yet. So this is why you're seeing every all this flood of new vehicles coming in, and they're doing quite well. And there's even some above thirty thousand dollars that are doing well as well. But the, the devil's in the detail in these conversations. Those five points happen. The point, the point with Tesla though is, by the time that you know these companies quote unquote catch up in hardware, Tesla is making the next leap. Whether it was the castings, now it's going to the unbox model, and they're looking for ways to figure out how to reduce the total process time and how to leverage more of the fixed assets in the factory and reduce capital labor. And then after unbox, then you're going to have potentially you know a, a humanoid assisted manufacturing process, which the Chinese will get to as well at some point. So it's going to be a question of quality, qu quantity, and speed in terms of integrating, you know, humanoid bots in the factory. So the point is, is they're catching up and, and it's, and it's quick, but then Tesla makes another leap, but the big, that another leap in hardware, but the bigger leap that Tesla is making, even if they catch up to Tesla and hardware, the bigger leap Tesla is making is on software, is on autonomy, is on the network infrastructure side with, their, their super clusters, which will eventually um, house Dojo as well. This is where, you know, Tesla is actually extending the lead there. So by the time they catch up, the, you have to look at the total package. Companies just don't make hardware. They have to make hardware and software. And then it, it, you don't, you don't uh, judge the contest based on one attribute of one company. If Tesla sells hardware, software, and services, supercharging, insurance, if they sell all these different things and they're very profitable, that's how you, in energy, you have to, you have to judge the, the company on everything that it's able to supply. So long answer, but it's, as they catch up, Tesla makes a bigger leap forward. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that because, you know, is it true? Yes. This is the way the Chinese, uh, that's why they welcome the new technology so that they can then create their own OEMs and they're being very successful. But unfortunately, Tesla is such an innovation engine uh, that continue to work. And you just explained all the things they're doing in manufacturing, but also software, full self-driving. And so maybe they can continue. And it looks like that they are going to be Tesla number one, nine Chinese companies. Top I'd 10. say one more thing about, about China. If you look at the percentage of students in uh, engineering yeah. school, it's yeah a gigantic number. It's a gigantic percentage. And if you look at the percentage of students that are in trade schools that are learning about tooling development, tooling fabrication, plastic molding, uh, metals, uh, j just, you know, the trades, they have been, they have been just crushing it for the, I would say the last two decades in terms of flooding students and just 
it, it, it's true. You've seen this thing on, on, on Axe and other places that Tim Cook talks about. He could fill a football field with the number of tooling engineers that are in China versus here. And that that is part of the equation as well. So it's not that just China goes in and copies. People think they just go and copy. They're highly innovative. They've they've built they've built a workforce centered around engineering and trades and AI, quite frankly. And you know they're going to be reaping the benefits of it. They're going to be a staunch you know competitor. Okay, let's continue on. So Elon Musk did say that our Shanghai factory is running at max capacity. So that article is absolutely not correct. And in fact, that is what happened this morning. We got updated information. Tesla China exported 23,241 vehicles in August. Domestic sales reached 63,000, the highest figure for the year. And we'll check the weekly insurance numbers for September tomorrow. This is the update um, that Tesla Chan is providing. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give the update, but basically compared to last year, we're basically caught up now from uh, pr previously being under. It's now getting getting caught up to what it is. You got Roland Percher. We take a look at his uh, tables quite often and it reached over 100,000 sales for the first time after two months of the quarter. So August is the best month of the year so far with 63,456. So this idea yeah. that Tesla is losing its lunch is not true. Some of his great charts here, you can see that in green, it's the first month and yellow is second month. And then as we see the third month, when that gets reported um, for the month of um, uh, the quarter, yeah, Tesla sales in China per month per quarter, you can see when the red comes in, yeah. it's going to we be the red, even the red bar. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just to, just for, there, for yeah. people, there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of numbers out there. What you want to do is look at domestic and look at exports in a month and just try to annualize it in your head. So you look at the 63 K and change the 23 K and change it's 86,000 units, you know, Basically, that's over a million uh, units annualized in terms of a run rate. And if you go look at this, is why Elon's statement is correct, you can kind of just put the two together. If you, I think, if you look in the um, earnings deck, I think they say Shanghai is you know greater than 950k annualized capacity, and this would tell you that they're running over a million. The run rate is over a million right now in terms of where they're at in August. I think this is the better chart to be looking at. It's take a look at Tesla by itself and how it's performing. The green is 2020. This is what they did from January to December 2020. The yellow is 21, red is 22, and then you got the uh, blue is 23, and then the this light purple pink is 24. So we're here in August, and we're basically matching what was happened last year, and very likely, maybe we'll see it's going to surpass next year, the uh, the following year. Basically, despite the economic down, you know, challenges that Tesla ha China had, they're doing just fine. But you can see the growth every year, except for the last year. So, you know, this is uh, they're doing well. Ch Tesla's selling everything they can make. Yeah, so, this is the importance of being profitable too, because right. what's happening right now is Tesla has gone down to zero and one percent interest rates in China, but they're coming from a place of profitability. And yeah, yes, their their ASPs are lower in China, but so is their so are their cogs. But when you're coming from a place of profitability, then you have the ability to deal with these situations. Right now, again, you know, eighty percent of people, at least in the U.S., that buy cars, you know, they use financing, and one in five people are being rejected for financing. There are, you know, you, you need a competitive rate environment in China, and the fact that Tesla does that, it does take a it does impact ASPs. It will impact gross margins. But Tesla being profitable and significantly profitable, I should say, has the ability to do that for some period of time. Remember, you know, global interest rates are going to be coming down. And so for some period of time, Tesla can do this and still compete and then not be in some big money losing situation where they have to worry about the viability of their company. Those other companies where they say, oh, their share, their share going to X, Y, and Z, those companies are either barely profitable or most of them, if not all of them, are losing money during this price war. And again, remember, Tesla is not directly competing with many of them yet because they're, most of their offerings are below $30,000. In the case of BYD, geographically and price tier wise, there's only 15% overlap between, the, between two and they're the number one and number two 
ship, shipping companies of EVs. Last story here is good news. Panasonic has announced that they're now ready to start shipping the 4680 battery production to automotive companies. Um, so they've announced that they have finalized preparations for this for mass productions of the 4680, and they're seeking to start supplying the cell to automakers. It's the uh, Japanese uh, factory. It's going to be the main factory for producing these battery cells. The company says have five times the capacity of a smaller 2170. So they're going all in on it. They've sent samples of the 4680 batteries to some automakers, which it is already a supplier and it tends to kick off production after getting the green light from clients. And it says here that it previously said it planned to start the production at this plant in the first half of the current business year. And so it's that started in April. So they're on time. And then you said this, this is the their internal approval. They're sending qualification samples to customers now. They will have to get approved as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thoughts on this? Yeah. I think this 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 was a little bit misread. I saw a lot of people forwarding around like it was, you know, very celebratory saying like, you know, 4680s are starting on a Panasonic. And it's just not the case. And I've been on, you know, I've done these qual both done these qualifications and been on the the side of these discussions. And the way the process works is the what what Panasonic communicated is that their internal factory is ready to their standards. But part of the process to turn on a specific customer model in the factory is getting customer approval on that model. Now, if Tesla and Panasonic did a lot of joint development on the 4680 and then the 4680 recipe configuration is the Tesla version, either the, the Model Y version or the, the Cybertruck uh, Supercell version, then that can cut down on the qualification time. But there's there's a, a point in time here between their factory being ready and then making customer qualification samples, and then the customer like Tesla and others testing those samples and giving formal approval. Now, during that loop, that could be you know a couple of months in terms of that loop. At some point inside of that loop, the, the, the customer actually has to give a risk authorization to Panasonic to start procuring raw materials so that when they give them the full authorization, say you're qualified, they're ready to start production. So that's the way the process works. This is just an indication of their internal factory being ready. It's a good sign, but they have to get customer approval on the 4680 from their various customers to start up those models. So there's going to be a couple of months here of, of that work. Now they could, again, they could get an approval to start ordering materials early. They could even get an approval to start doing assembly early based on how well the testing is going. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Lots of uh, great information that we shared today. Love it when Elon responds and actually shares even more information about XAI, the superchargers, and, um, you know, obviously these new developments. Thank you so much, Jeff. Follow him on X, the Jeff Lutz, but Mark Benioff does. <laughs> you should as well. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.